All right, how are you guys doing? Woo! We have um, another panel, one more panel before we move to the demos and dinner portion. Um, but before um, we get to them, um, we're just going to kill time while they move the chairs off. But this, I was hoping this would happen because I actually want to hear how the birds of feather of a feather went. Did you guys like it? Clap by. Okay. That. Um, I'm just going to put a quick plug in because we're going to send out a feedback form, right? And I really am trying to figure out how to infuse it into the schedule tomorrow so that you guys do take five minutes all together to fill it out because I promise you we read every single thing. There will be a part on there where it says any comments about the birds of a feather or any particular session or something like that. And I want to know what you liked about it. Somebody in one of them said it should be on day one instead of day two, which I love that idea. Um, another idea is we could just have it with the entire population of the, of the in-person conference, right? Uh, we could, it's something we could also do in the Gather Town app, hybrid, you know, online, virtually. It's a, just a great idea, I think, to like mix us all up and have these fun questions, some work-related, some personal-related kind of fun things. So I'm really glad you liked it. I do want to say there is somebody with eight siblings here, okay? Um, can you raise your hand? Where are you? There he is! Eight siblings. Is there anybody with more? Because I, I did a poll, but I, don't, I think that's it. And, and it's tough to beat. Sorry, there's somebody with 11? Somebody has 11 in there? Jess has 11 no siblings? Way. Okay, wow. Okay, go his parents. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Um, and the other thing I want to say is number of languages. Who here has the can speak the most languages. Does anyone call out if you heard a high number? More than four. Ooh. Someone who spoke seven. seven. Someone who spoke eight. That's amazing. Do I hear nine? <laughs> nine? <laughs> That's... <laughs> wow. 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 Amazing. Um, I love it. I love it at this summit. Um, okay. I think we're ready. Up next, we're going to have our afternoon plenary community talks. And we're gonna hear three more people working for organizations who are leveraging our Google mapping tools for social and environmental impact. These folks. First up is Jess Clark, who is Director of Information Management at the USDA Forest Service Intermountain Region in Ogden, Utah. Uh, Jess started working with Landsat imagery uh, to map burn severity in wildfires uh, supporting emergency response teams. And today he's going to tell us how the U.S. Forest Service are adopting Earth Engine for cloud-based image processing capabilities for the Forest Service to support natural resource management on public lands. So, big hand for Jess. Did I hear something about 11 kids? That's my family. <clears throat> I don't know if I win or lose that competition, but um, yeah, I'm, the, I'm one of 11 kids. I'm the fourth oldest, and so that was a really fun thing. We had the bell curve of siblings. Actually, it was skewed to the one, two, or whatever, and I was over, number 11 way over here. Fun times, great, great experiences growing up, but uh, I really appreciate this opportunity to be here. What a cool venue and a cool summit and conference and a chance to talk to you all about something I'm very passionate about. A, a few months ago, earlier this year, my son and I decided to sneak away from our home for a quick overnight camping trip. We went to a place called Stansbury Island, which is more like a peninsula now in the Great Salt Lake, within the footprint of the Great Salt Lake. Stansbury Island is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, one of our sister land management agencies in the United States government. And which means, by the way, free dispersed camping. I love it. So we go to this island, we, we drive around, look for a spot that looks appealing, uh, pull over, set up our camp, and make a little fire and start enjoying the evening. Well, as we're there, we noticed that a lot of other people have the same idea, but for different uses, which was kind of cool. We saw a car drive by with mountain bikes on a rack on the back of the vehicle, and it drove by as it had just finished a ride on the island. We saw another car come by that had been full of hikers who had just finished a hike. 
Off in the distance, we saw a handful of recreational camper trailers and their accompanying off-highway vehicles, their four-wheelers, their side-by-sides, just exploring all the dirt roads and trails on the island. Uh, just over the bluff from where we decided to set up camp, we saw evidence of people had used that spot for target shooting practice, very common uses on public lands. And then, of course, free-range cattle. Uh, great use of public lands as well. So we saw cattle roaming across the landscape and on the island and at some point crossed pretty close to our campsite that night as they were foraging for grass and food. So as I was there, it was like, wow, this is kind of crazy. And I, it was a really cool opportunity to show my son, who's 11 years old, say, this is what America's public lands are like. They're accessible to all. We can do what we want to do there. And we have different uses and different reasons for being there on the public lands and enjoying them. As a member of the general public, I love the access. As someone representing the Forest Service and a land management agency, it also presents a management dilemma that we need to work through. The Forest Service as an organization was kind of born out of what I'll say disaster based on the context of, of which it started. In the early 1900s, large wildfires were ripping through the United States West. They'd burned millions of acres of land, consumed lots of timber, valuable timber in a growing America. It had killed people, it burned over towns, and people who had been uh, charged to lead this brand new agency called the Forest Service were nervous. They said, this is not good. Fire is bad. Look what it's doing to this land we're supposed to be protecting and using and, and, uh, and managing and stewarding. And so they decided to, let's cut fire from the landscape. That was the, their best understanding at the time of the science of forest management, is fire clearly is a bad thing. Look what it's doing. So for the better part of 50 years, 60 years, we worked really hard to cut fire out of the landscape. We know now, of course, that was not good science. We made some, had to make some adjustments to what we were doing. Um, and we're still paying for that now because of land management policies throughout the years across the American West and how we deal with that and our understanding of what fire was like. So nowadays, we, we work very closely with partners, stakeholders all across the board and create what we call um, land management plans or forest management plans to say, what's our shared goal of this land? As the federal side, we pull in scientists that we have employed with us. We've got hydrologists, we've got soil scientists, geologists, recreation managers, you name it, we've got someone on staff that does it. And we say, based off your education and expertise of this land in the area, what do you think we should do with this land? How should we manage that? And then you pair that with months and months of public engagement and say, hey, citizen A, B, and C, what do you want to do here? You like to mountain bike? Great, let's consider more mountain bike trails. Oh, you're industrious, you want to open a mill next door and harvest timber and, and send it to industry, to, to the market? Great use of public lands. Um, you like to fish? Fantastic. So all these disparate ideas come together in the planning process the, of these land management plans. Some people, we want to, like I said, pull logs and trees off of the land. It's a renewable resource. We can do that. We're not the Park Service. Park Service wants to preserve their stuff, which is great, different purpose. We're here to use it and enjoy it for many years and for many users to come as well. So where does geospatial fit into all this? We need to understand what the land is, what's out there, where is it, what is it, and how, how can we use that? And we use geospatial data to help in that process. Lots of remote sensing. Uh, forests are big. Regions are big. We do a lot of um, large-scale analyses to understand these kinds of lands. About 10 years ago or so, we stumbled across Google Earth Engine in its infancy, really, and we saw it. And I started dabbling a bit, and I was really, really geeky at the time. I'm still really geeky, but you know, I was really just playing around on the platform and saying, this is pretty cool. I was a grown up basically in the remote sensing world as a desktop image processing person downloading tarballs from the USGS, extracting into NLAPS. You know, you, you've done that process, all you Landsat people. Um, and it was slow and tedious for what I was doing. And Earth Engine represented a change, a paradigm shift in what I was doing, and I got really excited. So for a number of years, we played around as trusted testers, and then we saw the value of this platform, and we worked really hard to try and work with our leadership to say, hey, this is an important thing we should adopt for a couple of reasons. One, it provides 
uh, access to most current data and science that are out there. This is a growing community. Every day, new users join into Earth Engine, and they have new ideas, new data sets, new, new algorithms that we can all pull from and learn from. What a great asset it is for us to be able to learn from you all. It also, we, had to, we, we worked hard to set up an agreement with Google through its partners, NT Concepts and Kerasoft, to say, we'd like to get a professional agreement in place, a contract, if you will, partly also to say that guarantee that Earth Engine would be around for us for more than a year or two or five. Um, so we had that agreement in place to work through that. So how are we using Earth Engine? I got three quick examples at different scales. At a local scale, and this is how I got involved in Earth Engine, was mapping the location, extent, and severity of wildfires across the United States, all the, all the forests across the United States. And we did it for a couple of reasons, and do it for a couple of reasons. Emergency response, what's gonna happen at the next rainfall over this burn scar? Will there be a debris flow into someone's back at their basement? We can analyze that. And also deforestation effects. Where did we have merchantable timber that's now gone that we need to replant? At a regional scale, as I mentioned, the land management plans is an example, right? This is one right here, the Northwest Forest Plan, a place where we've got two very disparate needs, right? We have Northwest United States is excellent climate and situation for growing large trees. They're great, they're awesome trees, they're beautiful, and they're very valuable. But we're also really good at uh, providing a habitat for the spotted owl. Those are two competing ideas here. Do you want to harvest timber? you want to uh, preserve a threatened and endangered species? The timber is a valuable thing for us, right? We want to contribute to the local economy. That's a very important thing for the Forest Service, is a local player in the economies there. So we had to figure out a plan to, to get those two spatial, the, the Venn diagram of those two things spatially overlap completely. And so we use Earth Engine to monitor our land management activities to say, are we still operating within the bounds of that agreed upon plan. Uh, monitoring forest activities across the area, make sure we're not making the forest too thin or leaving it too dense for uh, certain situations that would uh, adversely affect the plan. At a national scale, and this has been mentioned a couple times already this week, LCMS, Landscape Change Monitoring System, one thing to note is we manage land within a theoretical green line on a map. Well, right next to that green line is state land or BLM land or private land. Fires, insects and disease, drought, doesn't care where that green line is. So in the idea of what we call shared stewardship, good neighbor authority, for example, we work together with these stakeholders and partners who are just over the green line and say, how do we understand the land and manage it together? And so we have tools like LCMS that show slow onset change, like you see the orange pixels here, uh, or maybe red on the screen, I can't tell. Colored pixels show slow onset change like drought and insect infestation. And then fast onset change as well, like changes in water levels, fire, uh, fires that pop up, and harvest, and things like that. I have colleagues here who could spend hours talking about the why, uh, sorry, the what and the how we do all this. But I keep on getting drawn back to the why we do all this. To me, public lands provide some sort of shrine for us. We have different reasons we go out there, different reasons we enjoy them and they can complete, be completely different objectives for all of us. I, for one, love the vistas that mountains in the West provide. Big sky country without being called Montana. This is all, both in Utah, these pictures are both on public lands, enjoying the scenery out there. And again, maybe your, your reason for loving it is different. Maybe you want the solitude of a wilderness area. Maybe you want to harvest and extract timber. Maybe you, you're a cattleman or a cattlewoman and you want to graze your cattle on public lands. That's great. A couple years ago, I had an opportunity to visit a place in the local forest that was called the Fairy Forest, and I was so confused. What is a fairy forest? I walked up to this area with my colleagues, and uh, there had been trinkets hung in the tree and tinsel, and uh, people had arranged rocks to make pathways. They'd made Zen gardens, and they'd painted rocks. And I was like, I, I came in in a leadership role and I was kind of like, we gotta clean this up. This is actually illegal. It really was illegal. And I was like, clean it up. We, we gotta do that we gotta enforce future abuses. And then in this two acre area or so, I stumbled across this rock you see on the screen. Like of all places I could have walked, this is what I saw. And it says, I miss you, dad. We had many great times fishing and hunting in these mountains. I will never forget them. I know I will see you again. And at that moment, Again, my, my upbringing in the professional world had been pixels. Near infrared value, 0 0.3, whatever. 
Okay, and I also stumbled across this spot that had become a sacred spot for somebody who comes there to remember their now deceased father. And it kind of changed how I view that, the why we're doing it. We do lots of cool technical things for this purpose, to preserve these shrines, economic or personal shrines you might have out there on public lands. And what a cool um, learning experience for me to see something like that. So last thing, call to action for you. There is a call to action, get involved. You think of Rebecca Moore and one of her origin stories for all this kind of work was getting involved in public land management, not liking what the, what the plans were in her neighborhood and getting involved. We, we do ask for public comment and input on these kinds of things. But not just from the, what do you want to do? You know, you want more mountain bike trails or fishing holes, but also we need your collaboration technically. Forest Service isn't a super rich agency. We're not the Department of Defense. So we rely on everybody else to help us understand and learn and grow in these new algorithms and data and processes. So keep on contributing, keep on collaborating. We'd love to work with you, love to be a partner in this process. And you know that old adage, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that certainly uh, fits true as we try to manage public lands that each of us access and enjoy. So thank you for your time today. Thank you, Jess. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Eric W. Anderson, and he is a senior conservation ecologist at the Wildlife Conservation Society. Eric is known for the application of landscape ecology to problems in conservation, and today he's gonna to tell us all about how the Wildlife Conservation Society's use of Earth Engine is creating and, creating and studying the human footprint, a map of human influence on Earth. So please join me in welcoming Eric. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Great to see you all. Um, wonderful to be here at Geo for Good. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, we're having a little, I was supposed to go, Vivian was supposed to go, and those are Vivian's slides. Can you bring up the slides for Dr. Eric Sanderson, please? There was a little bit of confusion about the order of things. There we go. There we go. Is that all right? All right yeah, just holler if you need me. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Karen. Anyway, so um, just want to start out by thanking this wonderful team of people I've been working with for the last five years on mapping the human footprint um, globally using Google Earth Engine. Kim Fisher from the Wildlife Conservation Society, um, Dustin Sampson from Spark Geo, uh, Dan Robinson, who's in the audience tonight, um, from Panthera, now, in, now at TN, and Lucy Wright, the validator. Um, uh, validator of all, all of our work. So, um, like you, and probably like many of you, you know, I fell in love with nature and that's why I wanted to work in conservation for my career. Um, and I love nature for so many reasons, because it's so beautiful, because it's so functional, um, because it's so wise, and because it's so full of meaning. Um, and it just breaks my heart to see what's happening to nature in our, in our world today. And I think it's hard for many of us to appreciate what a changed world that we live in, um, in today's world. Um, a world of more people than there's ever been on the face of the planet, with each year an increasing population, um, driving economic flows of a magnitude that's just un unimaginable for previous generations. Um, then in turn is driving natural resource extraction, extraction and land conversion on a global scale. Um, to create habitat for all of us, for people to live in, um, and the expansion of cities, the growth of cities that we're all familiar with. And all of these things that were happening, that have been happening for all of our lives, um, these are actually a kind of unique moment in the history of humanity. There's never been so many people on such a global scale. And, um, and so even though you know, many of us enter conservation because we care so much about the wildlife and the wild places, in fact, you know, where conservation's really about is us and what's going on in our hearts, in our minds, the way we make decisions about how we spend our time and the decisions about how we manage, manage this world that we live on, um, both individually and collectively. And in that mode, I think the human footprint is a really valuable tool. Um, the human footprint's a map of human influence on the rest of nature 
and it's a gradient. It shows the level of human influence from more wild places with less influence to less wild places with more influence, with most of the world not being at either end of the, of the scale, but actually somewhere in between and constantly changing. Um, it's also kind of a, a very simple map. It's just adding up human population density, human settlements and infrastructure, um, human land uses, roads and other kinds of infrastructure and access from those, and power consumption on a global scale. Um, and then we take each one of these layers and then we, we weight them on a zero to 10 scale so that we can sum them up and then say something about this gradient of human influence globally um, at one kilometer resolution. Um, and when we first made this map in 2002, it was such a remarkable thing to be able to see the world on a similar kind of scale um, about human beings are affecting it and, and sort of query you know, these patterns that we see and think about, well, what drives those patterns? What, what, is, what is causing this pattern, both in history and in our time and into the future? Um, and you know, it was resolved so well enough that I could show it to my mom and my mom could point out, well, that's New York City and that's Boston and that's the I-95 free, um, freeway. Um, and to see sort of this gradient of human influence, you know, from like where I live in New York City, up into upstate New York, and then up into, up into Canada, for example. Um, and also you could take, you know, with this map of human influence, you could ask, well, where are the least influenced places in all the biomes of the world? You know, what, what's the extent of the Amazonian, um, the neotropical wild places versus the African versus the Asian? And you'll see that they are of different sizes and shapes that has so much to do with the wildlife that lives there. Um, so since this paper was published, and that was 2002, so that was a long time ago, um, there's been just a, a huge um, outpouring of other work that's been based on it. Um, some that use the human footprint as data for maps of the spread of invasive species or the resilience of landscapes to climate change or for species distribution models for evaluating the effectiveness of protected areas. But the human footprint also has had a role as a tool for communication. What does it mean to domesticate the earth? What, what do we mean when we say wild? I mean, what, what does that concept really mean? Um, how are impacts of different cultures, indigenous cultures versus non-indigenous cultures different? What is this Anthropocene thing? What is the future? What are the bottlenecks and the breakthroughs that we're going through? And the third utility of the, of the initial map was as a goad to make it better. Um, people started publishing national human footprints and regional human footprints and, and new syntheses like the Human Modification Index, which is another way of combining similar kinds of data. Um, people have applied machine learning to the human footprint and tried to make future projections. So you put all this together, and then a couple years ago in 2016, um, my colleagues Oscar Venter and these other folks um, put together a change product where we looked at two, two time points of the human footprint. And that allowed us to actually see, well, how is human footprint changing? How is human influence changing on a global scale? And kind of to our surprise, there were places where it was actually going down a little bit, and then other places where it was going up a lot. And we were able to actually map this you know, on, on a national scale, like for Colombia, as you see here. And where are the specific places where human influence is changing? The sort of take home message from this paper was that um, although the human footprint between the sort of mid 90s and 2009 had grown 9%, the human population over that same period had grown 23%, and the economy had grown 153%. So although human influence is increasing, it's not keeping pace with the population and the economy, and we speculated about why that is. So, with all this in our mind, I was sitting just like you in the audience in, in 2017 at Google for, at Geo for Good and scratching my chin and um, with my colleague Kim and we thought, well, could we use Google Earth Engine to do this mapping instead of the kind of GIS tools that we'd used before? And our, our idea was, you know, we had this human footprint one and it had various inputs that were appropriate at that time, It's kind of the only thing that was available back then. And then, you know, there was this other one that came out in 2016 that had some layers that were dynamic, but some that were static, like the roads layer didn't change and the infrastructure layer didn't change. And that was valuable, but couldn't we do better? Couldn't we, I don't know, use these layers and do it on an annual time step using Google Earth Engine? Um, 
and make continuous time points so we can measure continuous change, increase the resolution from one kilometer to 300 meter because the, da the input data had improved, and make it more dynamic by bringing in open street map and the better nighttime lights from the VIR sensor. And in this way, create a system that would go into the future so we can continue to compute the human footprint going forward. Um, and you know, I know I've had many conversations with you, you know, a big, you know, a big problem, a big thing that we've often missed with um, the Earth Engine catalog is having the open street map. So we built our own pipeline to take monthly extracts of, of open street map, fool the tags, and then put them into assets that are now um, available to all of you, as I'll show you in a minute. Um, and then we did validation using Google Earth Pro, of course, because the historical time slider allowed us to look at different points in time and see the level of human influence. Um, so what we found is that, whoops, I'm sorry. I sh can you go back one slide? Because this is where we want to do the demo. So if you go to WCS Human Footprint, can you bring up? Yeah, thank you. Um, there, if you go to WCSHumanFootprint.org, you'll see this website. If you click on this red button here at the top, it brings up a map of the human footprint, and there's a slider here that allows you to look back in time. If um, you're red, green, colorblind, we have a different color scale for you, so you can see the pattern of human influence. Um, if you go to the, um, the resources page, there are a series of apps that, that Than built um, that allow you to compare the human footprint for two years. So this is, you know, 2001 to 2020. And this, you know, of course, is the power of Earth Engine to be able to zoom in and see these changes on such a local scale. Um, you can also see all the, all the inputs here. And then if you go to, if you go to this data access page here, um, you can see our code, it's up on GitHub, and you're welcome to look at it. Um, you can get the Earth Engine assets here, um, like this, it'll open up this, and you can copy and paste the code up here to import it into your own application. These are the, these are the links. And then finally, if you prefer, we have the TIFFs available for the last 20 years. Okay, so can I go back to the slides and I'll finish up? Thank you. So anyway, please, please look at it. Um, one of the things we discovered is that um, the human footprint, if you add in the OSM data, the OpenStreetMap data, and the VIRS data, you get a different trend. Um, and in fact, you know, this makes sense. If you look at G roads and some of the other infrastructure layers we've used in the past, they don't have as many roads as OpenStreetMap does. Um, and so adding those in um, actually increases the level of human influence for mapping and changes the trend over time. It also increases the variance. Uh, there's a preprint paper that's available that it delves into more of these changes. Um, but really, it's kind of a, a whole new world in terms of human influence mapping, um, adding this data. But I want to just conclude by saying that even more importantly is, you know, um, and this is really a point that Kim's been driving home to me, that we really need to think about this human footprint mapping and other kinds of mappings on Earth Engine as a system. We have a set of well-defined inputs that are, you know, that are, you have a well-defined system or method that applies on them on a well-defined platform that creates these outputs. And the advantage of that is that we can run the system at any time point. So if we, you, know, you have inputs that are come more often, you can make human footprints that come more frequently. That the architecture is open. So if you, know, if you have a better layer, if you don't like our land use layer, want to use your own land use layer, you can do that. Or if you want to weight them differently, you can do that. Um, so by sharing it, that makes it possible for all of us to innovate better. And then it allows this sort of trend analysis over time um, that allows us to actually say something more specifically about hu human influence is changing and then therefore what it means for tigers as we're doing or for um, jaguars and bison and lion or for what it means for urbanization and cities. So I'll just leave you with this thought. How will you reimagine the human footprint and how will you build it into your projects uh, to speak at future Geo for Good? Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. All right, thank you so much, Eric. Um, So I 
accidentally messed up my, the slides. That's why Vivian was supposed to go second and Eric was supposed to go third. That's why her slide was there. Um, so I'd like to go back to um, the last slide in Eric's talk, please, and go to the next one so I can have the uh, Vivian's bio. So you guys have the proper bio introduction. So this is my fault. If not, if not, I can wing it. There we go. Oh. Okay. It's going to be, okay, okay. So I'm gonna welcome Vivian Robiero. She is from the Stockholm Environmental Institute. And today she's gonna to talk to us about TRACE, which is a sustainable supply chain uh, uh, tool that she's created using Earth Engine. So please join me in welcoming Vivian. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm still trying to manage all those things that is going on right now, which is kind of like the caffeine levels. And then I have the slides here, and then I have the clipper. It's a lot of things, but we're going to do it. It's just the last presentation, I promise. So for those I haven't met yet, my name is Vivian Hibigo. I'm a data scientist, and also I lead the Trace Spatial Intelligence component. And before I can talk a little bit more about Trace, I just want to give a really short introduction which is actually nothing more than Rebecca's already mentioned in her first presentation, and the importance of bringing a little bit of the component about supply chain. So deforestation is going on, and we know that for some, some situations, so for example, for some context, like Brazil soy or Brazil beef, or even in, in Paraguay, associated to the expansion of the pasture lands, deforestation is going crazy. However, we also see some good news in some places. So for example, the reduction of the deforestation associated to palm oil in Indonesia is brilliant. We just hope to stay in the same way, in the same pattern that we saw before. The problem is a lot of this is actually out of our control, but we know some facts that we need to consider. So I think three or four weeks ago, it was the same day that the queen died. So I'm um, so my condolences for those from UK and also not from UK. So we published this paper on science and it's showing us that 90 to 99% of the deforestation is driven by agricultural expansion. Okay, that's okay, but then we also show that 45 to 65% of the areas are under active production. What's weird with this number? What about the other 35%? So we are having a lot of deforestation that are not, not actually converted to commodity production. And there are a lot of factors that we need to consider in this reality. So people are actually deforesting for things like uh, land speculation and the, or, or other the, the, the land under dispute. And this type of thing is the deforestation that is actually going to nowhere. But we need to consider that also this is uh, what brings us the concept of telecoupling. So things are actually connected around the world. So the soy that is produced in Brazil goes to everywhere, including China, European Union, and other countries in South America as well. So that's the point when we need to bring everybody together to approach this challenge. It's not only about talking to the countries of production. And this is supposed to be an easy issue, right? Because when you look at the traders, the companies that are trading this product, we can see that 60% of the production is actually concentrated in a very few, a small number of companies. However, the supply chain or the patterns associated to that is far from simple. So we know that we have a lot of indirect sourcing, we know that we have a lot of unknown, and direct sourcing is definitely not the pattern. So for example, the beef in Brazil, the cattle sector, the, the animals, they go from one municipality to another and then to another until you go into the slaughterhouse, sometimes traveling from different states. And that's what makes traceability so complicated, so challenging. And this is and this very complicated, very confusing, but amazing world of challenges that Trace was born. So what is trace? Trace map supply chain. We do quite a lot of other stuff as well. We have trace finance, we have trace insights, but originally what we started doing is to map supply chain the subnational level. What this means? This means that we are detecting, for example, the soy going to China where the soy was produced, but also what are the actors involved in this trade? So for example, Cargill trading, Cargill as an exporter, as importer between France in a municipality in the middle of the Mato Grosso state in Brazil. But how we do that is also a very interesting question. 
So mm, there is no data that you can download that say, oh, download this piece of data and then you're gonna map the supply chain to some national level. No, you can Google that, you're not gonna find that. <laughs> but that's just a recommendation in case you wanna put that on Google, it would be amazing. So we just mix a lot of different data to construct this idea to build this story from the beginning to the end. And let's start from our first component, which is the per shipment rate. So we have information from custom declaration, bills of lady, or shipping, shipping man manifest. They are telling us what are the countries, what are the volumes that they are buying, and what are the traders involved in this trade. We also have from information from the country, and sometimes we also have this information from the per shipment uh, trade information, what are the ports and the facilities. The facility is actually a brilliant, a brilliant data that we have. So for example, where are these lawyer houses that are involved in the beef supply chain? Where are the silos or the mills? So we have this information from, from the, by searching this information in the country. And then we can plug this with our last piece of information, which is the production. So some, some countries like Brazil, they are really good in terms of putting this information in a very well structured way, and then we have API, APIs to, to find that. But some other countries, it requires a little bit more of engaging with local organizations or going deeper on the, the websites to understand what are this production, this information. So in the end of the day, what Trace has is something like this. So for example, the France, this is a real flow, by the way. It's a real trade flow. So France is buying 748 tons of soy traded by Bungi that went from the port in Salvador State. The silo is located in Alto Araguaia, Mato Grosso, but it was produced in Canagana, which is another municipality in the country. But this is not the full story. So we also bring together the impact associated to the supply chain. One of those, the deforestation, which is the concept of commodity deforestation exposure. And what is commodity deforestation exposure? It's nothing other than the deforestation that happened for this commodity to expand and to be traded. We have some parameters that make sure that we're connected to this in a real way because sometimes we have difficult conversations with the sector, especially when they want to overlap deforestation and soil in the same year. And so tell us that like, there's no deforestation associated to soy. Come on, it takes at least one year to transform this, er this, this area to soy. So we have some parameters like allocation and lag periods to really associate deforestation, to link deforestation with commodity production. But then we need to bring this information that we are calculating with help of Google Earth Engine with the supply chain with the subnational flows that we map it. And that's how we do that without really fancy statistics. We're just distributing. So let's say that we're talking about the municipality producing 500 hectares. And this 500 hectares is a municipal, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, uh, 500 hectares of deforestation, which is actually 100 uh, tons of soy production. So if you have a trader that is trading 50% of the volume from a specific place, we are linking 50% of the deforestation from this place. And this distributes, the, this propagates in the supply chain. So if the trader is traded 50% and then we have this 25% going to another country, it just, just propagates all, uh, in, the, in the supply chain. At the point that we can also engage with countries. For example, in the example I, I mentioned before, France. This is the result. So this is our platform and you can see that we have some very nice and colorful flows right here because we also have other information. So when we bring this type of information with the type of impact or as we say internally the indicators, we are concerned about deforestation, we're concerned about emissions, we're concerned about zero deforestation commitments. And this is what we support. We support that we really need to transform this international supply chain in supply chain free of deforestation. So for example, what you can see here in these flows with different colors is the zero deforestation commitments in Brazil. So the dark green is the soy moratorium where we don't have deforestation associated to soy after the year 2008. We engage a lot with countries. So governments are starting to look at this, this information. So for example, the, the French dashboard that we have and enable the countries to look a little bit more on their responsibilities in terms of what they are importing. We also have some other pieces of analysis with the Germany uh, mapping national exposure to imported deforestation. However, everybody here probably have this kind of like an emotional connection with a project and that's the case for the Pastel Prato. 
So trace is, real about, is really about international supply chain, but this app is about the beef supply chain in Brazil. So Brazil is the major producer of beef around the world, but also the main exporter of beef, and it's still around 75 to 76% of the production remains in the country. And that's why we couldn't really close our eyes to that and we developed this app, which is mapping, which is just bringing, it's kind of like a spin-off from Trace, bringing the flows to the hands of consumers. So people go to the supermarket, they access this information associated to the piece of beef they see in the shelves. And then they, all, they can assess all this information on the impact of the environmental impact, the uh, slavery embedded or not in their, in their products, or the sanitary inspection, and we also have information on burned areas. This is great. We are informing consumers, but there is something else. When the consumer do that, when they do that in front of the shelf in the supermarket, they also connect to the supermarket with the slaughterhouse, creating to us the last link in the supply chain and enabling us to engage with supermarkets to put pressure or enable them in so a more sustainable procurement. So this is an example of how the trace data was actually converted to a more internal and impactful product inside the country. And what's next for us? What's the future? We are now moving towards having more of our data, our spatially explicit data available for all of you. So that's why we are working on Trace Spatial. Probably that's the reason why I'm here right now. And to all these amazing pieces of information that we put together to build the supply chain will be available for all of us. So where is the slaughterhouses? Where are the volumes? What are the, the dynamic associated to the deforestation around the silos or the crushing facilities? But we also have other information. So for example, the companies, where are their they, them located, what kind of habilitation for, for economic activities they have. We also have the next frontier, which is the future risk. So we want to be more propositive. We don't want to be only reactive. We don't want to only want to see to the past. We want to look to the future. And we want to talk to these companies and say, you can definitely change your supply chain and improve it, reducing the deforestation at the point that you'd not, you're not going to have deforestation embedded in your supply chain. So that's definitely a new frontier for us. And I'm, I feel like I, I'm definitely in the right place for that. I have been such an, like, in such amazing conversation and discussion with you all. It's such a pleasure to be here. If you want to talk more about supply chain, all the assets, all the information that we're bringing together to tell us a story, please send me a mail or just let's, let's drink a beer. Thank you. <laughs>